Coming up on Tech News Today, tech titans tell NSA to stop it. Stop with the surveilling. Meanwhile, the NSA is busy playing Warcraft for great justice. And Google may launch a Nexus TV next year. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, December 9th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by TechServe. TechServe assists U.S. businesses of all sizes with their technology needs, including Apple, Avid, Adobe, and HP solutions. Visit TechServe.com slash TNT and receive a complimentary iPad deployment assessment. And by Shutterstock.com. With over 28 million high-quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 25% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code TNT1213. And by Stamps.com. Start using your time more effectively with Stamps.com. Use Stamps.com to buy and print real U.S. postage the instant you need it right from your desk. To get this special offer, go to Stamps.com now, click on the radio microphone, and enter TNT. That's Stamps.com. Enter TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachter. I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show that keeps you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world. Put some in some context for you. Starting with the top 10 stories of the day, the News Fuse. Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Apple, AOL, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Yahoo have formed the Reform Government Surveillance Group in order to put pressure on the U.S. government. In an open letter, the group calls for changes, including limiting collection of information, increasing oversight and transparency, inspiring the free flow of information, and ensuring the harmonization of worldwide law. The website for the group is at reformgovernmentsurveillance.com. According to documents leaked by Edward Snowden and published by The Guardian, the NSA has been monitoring online gaming communities since way back in 2008 and sending reports into online RPGs posting as players sending agents. Xbox Live was a targeted service, as was World of Warcraft. Second Life was another. None of the leaked files suggest that this tactic actually caught any terrorists, at least not yet, even though undercover operations were apparently so many that the NSA, one NSA analyst called for a deconfliction group to be set up to prevent the agency's personnel from spying on each other. I just got to let that one sit. Sounds good to me. on the shelf. So Square just introduced a brand new credit card reader. Uh, the device itself is 45% thinner than the previous model. And Square says it's the thinnest mobile card reader on the market. More importantly, the new device reads cards more accurately, and it works with a broader range of devices. Sorry, I was still looking at the thing Sarah left on the shelf because, wow. Uh, Verizon announced Monday morning that it intends to acquire Edgecast, a content delivery network that hosts media and other files for websites like Pinterest and Hulu. Edgecast makes most of its money, though, from telecom partnerships, according to GigaOM. Edgecast will join previously acquired CDN Uplink as part of Verizon Digital Media Services. No price was announced, though TechCrunch estimates the acquisition could cost Verizon around $350 million. China Mobile and Apple have finally worked out a deal to bring the iPhone to China's largest mobile network and iPhone 5S pre-order sales begin this week, with China Mobile's new 4G services also going live on December 18th. The pre-order listing and advertisement for 4G and the iPhone 5S is already live on China Mobile's official website, and the company confirmed to the Wall Street Journal that it will indeed kick off pre-orders starting this Thursday. A prank message on 4chan is leading some folks to break their Xbox One consoles or be stuck in an endless startup loop. The message claims to give you steps to make the Xbox One backwards compatible with the Xbox 360. Now, Major Nelson posted a tweet saying, To be clear, there is no way to make your Xbox One backwards compatible, and performing steps to attempt this could make your console inoperable. <laughs> it's called, take out the internals of the Xbox One and put in the internals of an Xbox 360. That's the only way you're going to do that. 
WikiLeaks published more information about the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement currently being negotiated in secret in Singapore. The agreement largely focuses on general trade among Pacific Rim countries, but has come under criticism for attempting to include SOPA-like penalties purportedly meant to combat copyright infringement. If signed, countries would have to change their existing copyright laws to match the treaty's requirements. The leaked document states that the U.S. is exerting great pressure to close as many issues as possible this week. Facebook has created a sympathize button as an alternative to the like button, such as let's say a user selects a negative emotion from the Facebook feelings options in a status update. In that case, the like button would change to sympathize could come in handy. A Facebook engineer said at a company event the button had been created as a part of a eternal project during a compassion research day where members of both the public and researchers were invited to improve Facebook's understanding of the driving forces and benefits of compassion. Oh, it's about time somebody did. Samsung introduced the first ever one terabyte MSATA SSD meant for Ultrabooks. The 840 Evo MSATA achieves 540 megabytes per second read speeds and 520 megabyte per second write speeds. The drive thickness is just 3.85 millimeters and weighs in at a mere 8.5 grams. Pricing has not yet been announced. Yeah, the hard drive also has no compassion. Uh, Google <laughs> found that France's cyber defense division was spoofing its domain certi certificates. Google says that the certificates were issued by an intermediate certificate authority linking back to ANSSI, a French certificate authority. The French agency says the fake certificates were the result of human error, which was made during a process aimed at strengthening overall IT security. <laughs> they were shocked, shocked to find fake certificates inside of this Oops. cafe. Uh, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, TechServe, New York's premier authorized Apple reseller and technology provider, serving creative professionals at all levels, levels or levels, either one. Mm -hmm. If you're an individual, that's where the level was coming from. Uh, or if you're a Fortune 100 company, TechServe carries a full range of Apple products, from iPhones and iPads to iMacs, MacBooks, iPads, iPods and accessories. In fact, we talk all the time about one of the most impressive things they've done. Uh, one and a half million visitors are going through the Delta terminals uh, this past year, and they have had a double digit increase in food and beverage revenue and the highest customer satisfaction scores in all participating airports. How do you do that? One of the things they did was they put an iPad at every seat. OTG management called on TechServe to provide, configure, and install the world's largest deployment of iPads a number that just keeps growing as they add new terminals to this effort. TechServe is a natural place to turn for just this sort of thing, no matter what size your project is. They do full lifecycle management for all your technology needs. They provide the devices you need. They get them up and running. They teach you and your staff how to use them. They don't just say, here's your devices. Good luck with that. And they maintain them so they're working efficiently and provide ongoing support. So if you have a problem down the road, you just call them. If you're considering adding iPads to your business, why not ensure the project success with the world's most experienced partner. If your business is considering integrating iOS technology at your workplace, then contact TechServe today and receive a complimentary iPad deployment assessment. Visit TechServe.com slash TNT and TechServe will help you assess your current or future iPad needs and give you advice to make it a success. That's TechServe.com slash TNT. We thank TechServe for their support of Tech News Today. All right, joining us to discuss some of the stories in the world today, Sasha Segan, lead analyst at mobile at PCMag.com. Good to have you back on the show, Sasha. Thanks for having me on. Uh, we have an NSA rock block to start the show. Are you cool with that? <laughs> yep, I love NSA stories over here. There's always a new one. First one's the obvious one about the letter from everyone. The second one is the hilarious one about World of Warcraft. We'll get to that in a second. But let's start with the Reform Government Surveillance Group. Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Apple, AOL, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Yahoo, in case you missed that. Uh, their platform echoes that of a bill being pursued by Jim Sensenbrenner and Patrick Leahy in the U.S. Congress. It would limit government's authority to collect users' information, saying you really got to just go after the bad guys, not just do their dragnet and capture everything. Uh, that is directly opposed to what Senator Dianne Feinstein wants to do, which is make the dragnet capturing of everybody's metadata legal. Uh, it, it asks for oversight and accountability to be increased, uh, adversarial procedures in, in the secret courts, transparency about government demands so that they can tell people what's being asked for in general, not specifically, uh, respect for the freer flow of information, 
and avoid conflicts about government so that we don't have people thinking, well, I got to keep all the data in this country because I want to only follow to those laws. And Brazil has, has been one of the countries that has been calling for just such a thing. And other companies have said, well, I'm not going to store my data in the U.S. anymore. Uh, they asked the U.S. Congress to, quote, take the lead and make reforms that ensure the government surveillance efforts are clearly restricted by law, proportionate to the risks, transparent and subject to independent oversight. Microsoft's Brad Smith in a related blog post said, or actually, I think he said it on the site too, people won't use technology they don't trust. Governments have put this trust at risk and governments need to help restore it. What do you think of this, Sasha? I mean, it, it, it's not surprising, but I think a lot of people are trying to determine, is this just PR move? Or is this like, you know, finally the lobbying muscle being flexed by the technology groups? Well, two things strike me about this letter. First of all, I think the companies are genuinely scared because if you look at these eight companies, what do they all have in common? They are all trying to be global businesses. They're all trying to serve users in hundreds of countries around the world. They want to dominate the globe. And people in countries outside the U.S. are saying, you know, very vigorously, we don't want the U.S. spying on us. We don't want, you know, the NSA is saying, oh, we're not spying on U.S. citizens. But of course, that leaves everybody else on the planet for them to spy on. And everybody else on the planet is saying maybe we shouldn't use Facebook, AOL, Apple, if that's a carte blanche for the NSA to spy on us. So it's critical to these businesses and their global businesses uh, for them to get some sort of clarity and be able to assure their users outside the U.S. that they aren't just a honeypot for U.S. spies. And then the second thing that struck me is a couple of companies that aren't on the letter. And you see none of the big telecom backbone providers who are actually the low-level networks that the NSA is tapping into. There's no AT&T, there's no Verizon, there's no Level 3. And so you get to the point where, okay, so if Google decided to harden itself against NSA spying, well... If the NSA can still tap into the backbone, um, what can Google really do about it? Well, and that's why they're, I think they're pushing particularly to make it illegal or at least give some oversight to say it shouldn't be easy for them to tap into the backbone. Let's, let's clamp down on that because they couldn't get the cooperation of those companies. Also, I think significantly here, Amazon not signed on. And they are the type of company that signed on. Like you said, there's no telecoms on here. Uh, but Amazon is one of the big four, right? They're right up there with Facebook and Google and Apple. Uh, I'm curious. I'm not, I don't know why they're not on here, but I'm curious why. They might be. Amazon has, you, you know, Amazon has a lot of lobbying going on uh, with things like sales tax. And, you know, I, I think Amazon probably opposes NSA surveillance of its stuff, but may have decided that it wants to spend its credits in a more profitable realm for them. You haven't seen Amazon really at the in the forefront of these other NSA disclosures before. So maybe they think they're a little protected. Maybe they think they're not out as far in front as Google and Apple are. And they are rolling out web services for intelligence agencies. They, you know, they have federal contracts. Of course, Google tries to get federal contracts too, and they have a few as well, and they're still on this thing. Ayaz, what do you think? I th well, I'm looking at the, at the group here, and they, they, a lot of them seem like they're more social networky than anything. So you d you're putting your trust in a lot of these companies by putting a lot of your information on there. You're, sometimes they're private images you're just trying to ha share within small groups, or you're trying to keep your like professional information like LinkedIn, these kinds of areas. So the data you're giving over to these companies, you might find it to be shocking when it's given over to the government when you didn't want to give it to the government. And I'm thinking with Amazon, you, you're you very, very aware that you're giving Amazon this information. They even have at the end of your checkout, would you like to share this information on Twitter, which I think is a very strange thing, but they, they do give you that option. So Am Amazon not showing up here, that doesn't surprise me. And Sasha's point about uh, them worried about sales tax and, and drones, obviously right now, uh, they're probably busy doing other stuff. But to have the trust of your users, that's something that these companies have to have or they won't have users and that's going to cause them a big problem in the long run. Would you like to share this information with the NSA? Click here. That's all we ask. Just opt in. We'll do it. <laughs> Some of us probably would. Uh, the NSA and the GCHQ also reportedly monitoring online games since 2008. This is brilliant. Uh, the Exploiting Terrorist Use of Games and Virtual Environments paper was leaked from the Edward Snowden, Edward Snowden papers, uh, described as target-rich communications networks, meaning online games, where targets could hide in plain sight. 
agents were sent into Xbox Live, World of Warcraft, and Second Life, bravely posing as players attempting to recruit informants. Now, the paper references things like Hezbollah producing a game called Special Forces 2 for ten dollars for the free purpose of for the purpose of recruitment, uh, as an example of like the this is evidence that the bad guys are out there using games to recruit people. Uh, they did attempt to extract some World of Warcraft metadata from their troves of uh, gathered metadata. They were trying to link accounts and characters and guilds. And Blizzard says they did not do this with our permission. If they did do it, we didn't know about it. Um, so many people were in Second Life wandering around that they had to do that deconfliction group that Sarah mentioned in the news fuse to make sure that they weren't just tracking each other. So I have so many questions. Uh, <laughs> one... What was the average ranged DPS of an NSA agent? Uh, two, do we have a problem with the human intelligence side of this, of people playing? Or is it just the data interception that we should be concerned with? And who's the genius analyst who sold this and said, yeah, you know, I really need to be playing World of Warcraft at work because of the terrorists? I mean, whether, whether or not oh, there are any terrorists hanging out in World of Warcraft, I mean, it is an interesting place to... Just kind of sniff around and see, are people talking, you know, in the confines of something like a game, in code of some kind that makes it seem like they're just playing some sort of World of Warcraft or Second Life or that sort of game, but are actually exchanging information that could be harmful to anybody. I mean, it's, it, it's an interesting idea. You know, you want to hide in plain sight, right? And be able to communicate in a place that maybe seems really not obvious, or maybe some agents just want to play a lot of World of Warcraft. I don't really know. Maybe it's a little bit of both. It could I, be both. I it's also wonder, like, isn't there some sort of identifying factor that they could all be in agreement on so people weren't spying on each other without realizing that they were working uh, towards the same goal? It's going to be some, some, like, Yeah, but if they make username. an identifying factor, then other people could, could, uh, could catch on to it, right? Well, but if it was something that you know, just the agents knew about... Yeah. I don't know. It sounds a little messy. Deep cover, man. Deep cover. Yeah. Well, there, there's there's a big question, as you said, the the human intelligence question here. Like, let's set aside the bulk metadata stuff because, you know, most people I most people I'm talking to in tech, most people I know agree that's sure. a bad idea, but including all the, the signatories to that letter earlier, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's the human intelligence thing just really comes down to: Are we gonna have spies? And if we're going to have spies, who are they going to spy on? And every country, as long as there basically have been countries, has had spies, uh, human spies who go out and spy on other people. The question with things like World of Warcraft is that our spies are not supposed to be spying on people in our country, our citizens, or uh, citizens of allied countries we have particular agreements with. And in a place like World of Warcraft, which is borderless, how can they make sure they're doing that? Or do they just end up doing a lot of that domestic spying that they are not supposed to be doing? Yeah, I mean, that's the brilliance, right, of, of World of Warcraft or any online game is you don't really know who that other person is. But that makes that makes it tough because my first instinct is like, hey, spies can walk around in the world and spy and that's fine as long as. Yeah, but you're right, Sasha, it, they, they should be only targeting uh, non-U.S. people for because there's different laws for that sort of thing. And that, that does make it difficult. I'm still not sure that I'm against it entirely. It's all it's all about how they go about it. And that's where oversight and transparency and those right. sorts of things are necessary so that we right. can it's have a robust conversation about it. Right. It's about do you go about it intelligently? Are you trying to follow the rules? Um, are you doing this in good faith? Or are you just, you know, are you, are, you, are you trawling the bottom of the ocean with a net, picking up every possible piece of sea life and plant life and leaving it desolate? Also, if I'm, you know, LFRing, I want to know if that's an NSA guy in my group. Come on. They all do. Motorola wants to see if Project Ara is the future, Ayaz Akhtar. Yeah, so Dennis Woodside was giving an interview uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago, and he was talking about Moto Maker and, and Motorola's built-to-order tool. That's, the, that's what it's called. He says that Moto Maker and Project Ara might converge, and Project Ara, if you forgot, is that open-source initiative where you pretty much have it's the phone blocks concept, kind of like a Lego-like concept when it comes to phones, modular components that you can put onto a skeleton, Woodside said there's actually a prototype built for Project Aura right now, but he didn't give a timeline. 
he says one of the problems is right now having those components talk to each other because there's no uh, there's no standardized protocol just yet when it comes to that. Uh, he says he doesn't know how long the skeleton of the phone itself would last. So let's say you keep replacing parts. He doesn't know how that's actually going to work in practice. He says they have to see where it goes. This is his words. Uh, Woodside also talked about the Moto G, and he said it was supposed to be as good as the iPhone 5, iPhone 5 for a third of the cost. Uh, there was a teardown of the Moto G, and research firm Tech Insights told the Wall Street Journal that the 16-gigabyte Moto G is uh, it's $123 in components alone. The 16-gigabyte model costs $199 unlocked. So that means Motorola is probably making about 5% in operating profit on each Moto G sold because obviously there's advertising and other overhead. And for comparison, Samsung, they make about 20% profit on a mid-range phone like the Galaxy S3 Mini. Sasha, do you think Aura is the right future for Motorola or this, this low-cost budget approach phones? Well, 5% margin is not going to make a super successful, super profitable company. I mean, Amazon has shown that you can make a really awesome hardware product at a really amazing price if you are using it to uh, basically tease or incite sales of other stuff. And that's the whole Kindle Fire idea. These cheap, high-quality tablets which get, get you to buy more things from Amazon. Now, with Motorola... You know, I guess they are trying to get more people into the Google ecosystem, but I haven't really heard a philosophy from Motorola that isn't we are actually still trying to make money on hardware. And 5% is a really narrow profit margin. I mean, Project Aura, I still don't know if I believe that it's practical. There was something similar a couple of years ago from an Israeli company called Modu that really flopped. There's a lot of engineering questions around this, but he's trying to keep uh, Moto Maker in the conversation. And I mean, one of the greatest mysteries of this year for me in phones is why is the Moto X not doing well. I mean, this is my Moto X right here. There's a lot of like the mobile cognoscenti who I know who love the Moto X. And with Moto Maker, it's an amazing phone and it's so tasteful and so well done and so not a blockbuster seller. And Motorola is just trying to crack that and uh, get more people to come over and see, hey, if this Project Aura sounds like a fabulous idea, you know, ooh, hey, the Moto X is pretty good, isn't it? Maybe I should buy one of those. Yeah, I think uh, I, I want to say Google, but let's say Motorola uh, because they are they are sort of operating on their own, but with a very Google way. I think Motorola is doing a better job of keeping themselves in the conversation. Uh, they may not have the the phones that really capture anyone's imagination quite yet, but they've got some fine offerings like you've talked about here, Sasha. And I think Project Ara is part of that effort to keep. Motorola in the conversation to keep people talking about, hey, they're doing some interesting things over there. It's also just a little bit of Google Skunk Works methodology. Like, let's throw some stuff against the wall and see what sticks. Maybe it'll be Aura. Maybe it'll be some kind of weird voice control. Who knows what? But let's let's get these projects going so that eventually we can roll something into a Motorola phone that is something that people love and nobody else has. It seems like Motorola for a while, they, they, they've lost a lot of their luster when it comes to their name. People don't think, Motorola, that's an awesome phone. You remember like the Razer, that was like super hot. And the smartphones came came and basically throw, throw Motorola away. Can't talk today. Sorry about that. Um, but Motorola, they are slowly building their brand back up. They need a lot of marketing budget. We've seen that work for Samsung. They throw tons of money uh, for television ads print ads, like on buses, they're everywhere. Motorola doesn't have that kind of budget just yet. But if they can build quality products in the long run, maybe they'll make a dent. But Project R, I think, could be really intriguing if they did like built-to-order phones. Maybe not necessarily modular that I can switch them out. But if they can, that could be interesting. Yeah, it's another great thing that they can go with this, right? Is 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 you don't end up with Project R being the product, but you learn so much from it that it informs all kinds of other projects. That's Yeah, that's I think that's... That's more likely to be the final outcome here because they're they're establishing this infrastructure with Moto Maker where, you know, it's like it's like old Dell PCs where it's built to order at the moment and you can pick your parts. And that makes for something really compelling that doesn't have a lot of the engineering challenges of something where the user could actually swap out the parts and get the contacts dirty and, you know, get things into weird places and attach things that don't work. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Shutterstock. Uh, at Shutterstock.com, 
you'll find that perfect image to express how you're feeling for any video or our or, or print project. Uh, Shutterstock images are great. If you've got a website, you've got a publication, you've got a pamphlet, uh, anything that needs images, don't go just taking one from any old place because first of all, it might not be legal and it might be way too expensive. Uh, and it just might not be very good. At Shutterstock, you can choose from over 28 million high quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips. They source their images from around the world and put them at your fingertips. Many contributors to Shutterstock are professional photographers and artists. Shutterstock reviews every image to make sure it's good before they add it to its library. And they've been adding 20,000 images every day. Uh, so every time you visit, you're definitely going to find something new. You can choose individual image packs or a monthly subscription for the best deal. And you can download 25 images a day on just the standard subscriptions. So they got something that's going to work for you. Download any image, any size. You pay only one price. They give you the images you need to bring your creative projects to the next level. And it's easy. I use it. I use it for websites. I use it for all kinds of things. Sophisticated search tools. You can search down and drill by gender, by emotion, by more. And the light boxes are great because you can store your stuff in there. You can share them with other people that are working on the project with you. And then figure out which ones you want to buy when you're ready to go. You can try Shutterstock today by signing up for a free account. No credit card needed. Just start an account. Begin using Shutterstock to help imagine what your next project could be like and save your favorite images to a light box to review later. Once you decide to purchase, use this offer code TNT1213, and new accounts will receive 25% off any package. That's Shutterstock.com for 25% off new accounts. Use the offer code TNT1213. We thank Shutterstock for their support of Tech News Today. Go check them out. Verizon, uh, getting into uh, a little more into the uh, content delivery business, uh, the content delivery network business. Sarah, explain what's going on with this, with their acquisition. Yeah, so as you mentioned in the news views, they bought, uh, are buying, in the process of buying Edgecast, which is a content delivery network, uh, which is a profitable one. And even though the price isn't public, TechCrunch is estimating it's a pretty big deal, around $350 million. Edgecast will help provide what Verizon calls quality, high-performance digital experiences to customers. The company's been around since 2006, um, delivers high-quality video content, and has worked with a variety of, of, of big companies, high-profile stuff, provides CDN services for clients like Pinterest, although I can't really think of what sort of high-quality video is associated with Pinterest yet, but hey. It's just the images probably, yeah. Yeah, Hulu, um, Edgecast uh, has partnerships with Deutsche Telekom and AT&T to, uh, to bring video to their mobile subscribers. So lots of experience there. And Verizon and Edgecast have actually worked together in the past. Um, uh, Verizon's Enterprise Solutions line is, is, is one of the initiatives. Although Verizon used to work with Akamai, which is another... Uh, CDN uh, a lot more closely. So it's a little bit unclear if by acquiring Edgecast, that's, that means that that is the sole per, uh, exclusive provider of, of, of high quality video. And then of course, there's the ongoing issue between not just Verizon, but Verizon, certainly one of the biggest companies and the FCC over net neutrality. And what does it mean uh, for Verizon to, you know, be, be putting emphasis on delivering the best video of stuff that it would like you to watch and, and um, and not counting against data caps and that sort of thing, Sasha. Do you see do you see much changing here? Does this acquisition kind of mean more of the same? Does the net neutrality angle scare you or bother you? I mean, the net neutrality angle is a little interesting, but it doesn't move the needle very far on that debate. I think the issues are still the same. This is just a case of Verizon identifying something that will make it a lot of money, and it is going to make a lot of money on this. Because, I mean, think about all the ways they're going to make money here. It is a basically profitable business. It is a basically profitable business that Verizon has had to pay, probably had to pay interconnect fees too. They won't have to do that anymore, so mm -hmm. they're going to make more money. And even better, they are making money from their competitors like AT&T and Deutsche Telekom collecting, uh, collecting interconnects and, you know, essentially like in the wireless world, roaming fees. So it's a really smart, um, it's, it's really smart for these telecom companies to absorb the content delivery networks into themselves because they save money and they make money. I mean, the scary possible future that you're pointing out, Sarah, and it is completely a scary possible future, is when the telecom companies own all of these CDNs, if it becomes a war between the telecom company CDMs, 
where, you know, um, AT&T starts charging less for stuff served through Akamai and Verizon starts charging less for stuff served through Edgecast and that filters down to customers and you end up in that horrible anti-net neutrality world where you have to pay separately to get every website you want delivered and they're all different numbers. Yeah, I, I, I do think that this could be a bad thing net neutrality wise, but let me put out a good way this could affect net neutrality because one of the big motivators for Verizon and any other telecom to fight against net neutrality is the fact that they have to not be a dumb pipe. They, they want to be more than a dumb pipe and they want to make more money on the connection with their consumers. So they're motivated to come up with a way to charge the incoming traffic as because they are already working as hard as they can on charging all of us to pay for, for the accessing of the traffic. However, if the telecoms start to say, look, that's just a, a bad idea. Maybe there's enough competition that people will always move to somebody that doesn't, that isn't expensive to access Netflix uh, or blocking Netflix or slowing down Netflix or whatever happens because of a net neutrality violation. So let's do something else to make money off our pipes. This is a great example of that. This is a way that a telecom can say, we're not just a dumb pipe. We're also a content delivery network. We're going to be hosting all of this information and we're good at, at networks. And so this makes sense for our business without leading directly to them saying, oh, and also you're going to have to pay to access our customers. I'm this really hoping for a sort of mutually assured destruction situation here where if the big telecoms each own enough of the content delivery networks, they'll all you know, negotiate even rates and say, let's not escalate and destroy each other and destroy net neutrality. I mean, that that was the situation with patents in mobile until Apple stepped in and started dropping nuclear bombs on people. I wonder if this has something as, as boring as the, uh, the Redbox partnership. Like, okay, we need to have some kind of infrastructure handle uh, our video streaming service, so why not pick up something like Edgecast? Uh, but I, I don't know what, what else they're going to do with it other than just continue these partnerships. Seems like this is a lot of really good networking opportunities, no pun intended there, but Pinterest, Hulu, and 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 these other companies, this seems like they could get their foot in the door with a lot more things that Verizon could push on their phones or they could push on lots of different other services. Yeah, it's a really good thing about, a really good point about a red box, I, I think. It, it, whether that's their main purpose or not, it certainly helps uh, to be charging yourself for that, that kind of hosting situation. Uh, Google launching something uh, soon, possibly, according to Jessica Lesson's new The Information website. Yeah, The Information says that Google's working on a Nexus TV device. Now, it runs Android, stream video from Hulu, YouTube, Netflix, and it'd be able to play some video games. Uh, the Nexus TV would not support live broadcasts, though. They're saying it's a set-top box, and it would come with a remote with a touchpad. The Nexus TV would launch in the first half of next year and be aggressively priced, whatever that means. A device like this was rumored way back in July after the Wall Street Journal reported that Andy Rubin demoed a Google-powered set-top box at CES behind closed doors. Sasha, there's not a whole lot of information about this Nexus TV, but does it sound like a winner to you? Can it stand out? This is a very crowded market. Well, the big question is, I mean, the big question is the user interface, of course. I mean, Google has been wanting to do this, this open internet-based TV thing for years. They had those Google TV boxes. And the problem with the Google TV boxes is they had these ridiculous 9,000-button remote controls, and the interface was all crusty, and they really didn't understand the TV interface. And I'm a little worried here because I read this Nexus TV story, and they're saying, oh, yeah, well, this will just be a platform that we hope people will build and innovate on. And I'm just hearing the Google TV story all over again. I think this is them rebooting Google TV because we haven't heard much, if anything, about Google TV in a long it's time. Dead. And Yeah, and, and, and they've had very minor bug updates to the thing. Uh, so they're saying, all right, we learned a lot from that. Let's just pretend that didn't happen and start off with a better brand name with Nexus. But again, without partnerships... I just, I don't see, you know, and maybe they've got some blockbuster partnership they're going to come out with along with this. You know, like we've got ABC to agree to let you subscribe directly to their shows a day later. I don't know. Something like that could change the game. But that's really, at this point, the only thing that's going to differentiate one box from another, I think. The Nexus line is supposed to be the best that Google has, right? It's supposed to be the, the Google's experience, instead of it being... Uh, being messed with by some other manufacturer, that would be the thing you're getting. But it seems like with Google TV, and I think that was supposed to be rebranded Android TV or whatever they're going to do with that name, uh, 
they the experiences you had were as good as you could possibly get. There wasn't like skins on top of Google TV with Logitech's box or, so, or Sony's boxes, but it just seems like the product is in a very crowded space. There's very little to, if they don't have content deals, there's nothing that stands out. If they can leverage all of the Android apps properly onto a television, maybe that could be something interesting. But it seems like it would be very, very controlled because it's it's just a video streaming box. What else are you going to do with it? It's just a Roku competitor at that point, right? Wah, wah. They, I mean, it obviously would do the Chromecast stuff. It would be stupid not to. So it should also be a Chromecast device where I can, you know, press that Chromecast button on my apps and send video to it. But once again, if you're getting Chromecast for 35 bucks, <laughs> then Google, this Nexus TV is going to have to, if it's any more expensive, it's going to have to supply a lot more in terms of value because that $35 Chromecast, Google has set their bar now. I think I just I figured out what this could be good at. If it's, right. if it's Google now on your TV, so it's, you're always already connected with what's going on. Mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got your calendar in Google. You've got your emails. If it can be like a personal assistant while you're watching TV, kind of like what Xbox kind of does, this idea that you can have your Google life on your television. Sure, you have these apps and things, but if it integrates with Google now, you're like, okay, Google, what's coming up today? Your TV starts acting like your assistant. Maybe that kind of works. Made more sense than a, a watch perhaps, but something like that. Google now, I think, actually, is, whatever they put that in, I usually end up using. So that, to me, might be the, the big differentiator here. Is this going to have HDMI pass-through, though? I have no idea. I mean, it, you know, not, no live TV support could mean we're just not going to have a streaming app. Uh, but I think you're right. I think it would make sense if it if it still did that Google TV thing where it's like, hey, we can act as your guide. Because that's that's been pretty compelling on the Xbox One, I think. The, I think it makes people use the Xbox One. It certainly makes me use the Xbox One more because it's right there and my TV is going through right, it. Trying to, trying to stay at input one. That's what they want to be, right? That, the whole, yeah. that whole thing there. Everybody wants to be input buy one. Peel. Buy. They should what? They should buy Peel. It's a company that does this uh, smart remote control and EPG program that you find on a lot of Android devices. Samsung and HTC are both bundling them at this point. And it's a lot of that pass through. Uh, it's, it's a lot of that uh, we're smarter than your cable box stuff that you're talking about. It's out there for Android right now. Well, that's something to keep an eye out if whoever buys Peel. There it is. Uh, but especially if Google buys Peel. All right, let's uh, finish our discussion section with talk about iBeacon, Sarah Ling. Yeah, not just iBeacon, but just the idea that uh, companies get a lot out of tracking you physically in their retail stores um, and are doing more and more experimenting. Of course, this is the holiday season, so people are doing a lot of shopping, and now is the time to try to figure out what do people actually like in the store um, and what do they gravitate towards? So these are physical gadgets that are in stores that help identify what people who are shopping there like. Prism Skylabs is one solution that's been working with a few retailers. It's a combination of security camera video with software that builds charts of people's movements and even uses heat maps to show what products get touched the most, what uh, products get picked up the most, how long a customer might sort of hover in a particular corner of the store, and it, you know, can in in helps as a retailer say, okay, well, obviously, this you know table uh, of bracelets is really popular. People seem to really like this. Why not bury that in the back of the store and then put some other stuff to, close to the front of the store that maybe the customer wasn't seeing ahead of time? Now, this is of course just applies to physical stores, but it can also give a little bit of an edge over an online experience, uh, which is really you know it's more of sort of a flattened. Hey, here are a bunch of products and then you figure out what you want. Um, when it comes to window shopping, the in-store experience is still, you know, really counts for a lot. Forest City Enterprises um, is, a, uh, is, is a chain that operates about 20 malls. Um, about a year ago, asked some of the restaurant tenants to open earlier on Black Friday. Uh, they asked them to do it this year because last year they noticed, hmm, so people coming in at midnight all sort of started to leave around 6 a.m. You might think it's because they were tired, but <laughs> the mall said, you know, I think they were hungry because they've been up all night and we don't have any restaurants that are open and now they're all flocking to whatever else is open to get some, you know, maybe an early breakfast. So let's have those restaurants open up earlier this year based on the data that we already, uh, that, that we already took uh, last year. Now, of course, this can backfire. Uh, some Nordstrom customers uh, complained after uh, the, the store was using Wi-Fi signals to figure out who you were and when you were in a Nordstrom store. 
Nordstrom had said, well, we had signs up in our stores that were supposed to tell you about that. But of course, if you don't know that the signs are there, you're probably not going to notice them. And I could see why people could get pretty bristly about that. The whole thing is extremely fascinating, Tom. You mentioned iBeacon. That's something that Apple's doing when you're physically in an Apple store. Sasha, again, it's, you know, it's kind of this privacy thing. Does this seem like, hey, this is smart. Retailers might as well figure out how to make the best experience possible for us, or is it just too much? Well, it really comes down to your own personal privacy threshold. And the obvious answer, of course, is to make everything opt-in and to make everything opt-in and you get coupons. Because at that point, probably a lot of people will opt in and the retailers will get their retailing data and people will get 10% off on that bracelet in the back of the store and everyone will be happy. Um, but it's, it's, it's very easy. It's difficult to create an opt-in system where everybody has to download something and people have to check things and it's, you know, it, it only works on certain devices and it's a lot easier to just, I guess, sniff Wi-Fi devices positions and Bluetooth devices positions and et cetera, et cetera, and just collect the data. But um, the the opt-in solution would be the solution that I think would end up with everybody happy, the retailers, the people getting the coupons, and then the people not opting in because they're paranoid and don't want anyone tracking them. What do you guys think? I mean, is, it, is, this, is this like... Do, do you feel like there's something, there's too much too involved much in, you know, they, they don't necessarily know your name, but they know that you're that guy who ended up touching the scarves for four and a half minutes. Which I do very regularly, <laughs> as, as everyone knows. I'm known as They're the cashmere. I mean, who you can, who touch can blame you? Uh, I, I know, I'm, I'm not really bothered by this concept. I mean, I, this, this is more fascinating to me than anything because when it comes to uh, tracking sh shoppers' habits or doing, like, even the science of grocery stores. Those things are just ridiculous if you find out how that works. This this idea that they're watching everyone anyway, I kind of had this, I, I guess I, I'm I'm not, not immune to this. I guess I'm used to this idea. The NSA is watching everything I'm doing anyway. Why wouldn't Macy's be watching me mess with the cashmere scarves all day? Uh, but the idea is, in theory, maybe they'll staff Th these areas better instead of it just being like, oh, why is nobody ever coming over here to help me? If they see this as a popular area, that could help customer service. It's them more money in the long run. But in a, in a shopping experience, again, if you're willing to turn over your money, uh, that's that's when people start getting a little edgy. It's like, oh, wait a second. Should I be watched right now? But yeah, they don't want you stealing stuff too. So that's another reason to keep watching you. <laughs> yeah, I think the bottom line nice is what course. Sasha said. Uh, make it opt-in, give me coupons, done. And that's that's the right way to, to go about this and make it make it so that it's easy for me to, to opt out too. if I change my mind later just throw that in there as well let's fire up the randomizer, randomizer. straw poll today with 54 percent of the votes go into steery a venture beat uh, story showing a parody video about apple's attempt at a driverless car car it's from a comedy group called the smart department uh you get it Pun on Siri. It's the, the typical guy in a white background talking about a driverless car. In the palm of your hand. By downloading Siri onto your iPhone, it allows you to control any car that you get into. Siri automatically communicates with the different computer components of your car's engine and steering system. It's simply that easy. If your car has... I think we all know where this is going. Uh, people seem to find it more entertaining than I expected, actually. I'm sick of the Apple video parodies. I agree with you. In general, I mean, I, I'm like, yeah, okay, this is kind of cute, but... It just, I was, it, this is not the first one. I was sick of the Apple video parodies in 2010. Yeah. <laughs> this, this joke is, this joke is so old, you know, it's, it's, it's so old that I've, I lack the last half of that sentence because I forgot <laughs> it because it was that old. Dang. Yeah. And uh, well, but I, I don't know how you feel, Sasha. Yeah, how be clear. How do you feel about Stop hedging. the Apple video parodies? No, I, I, it's Okay. You know, it's not real. I Great. I think I would have liked it more two years ago, but I, I am starting to get a little bit like actually like I'm a fan of a pun. I think it's well known. I like the Steery as the Apple self-driving car. That that's funny. But then once I started watching it, I'm like, oh, it's the English accent guy in the white background. Okay, we get it. It's Johnny I. It's also like, annoying that it's not a real product. Well, that too, right? I'd like it to be one. <laughs> 
So Please now I'm this. just disappointed. Right. But it's, <laughs> We're it's, all disappointed. it's shocking. It's shocking how even like even in 2013, you can just st stir up these massive passions among people by just doing pro Apple, anti Apple, mocking Apple, cheering Apple stuff like that seems to never get old for the audience. Yeah, it does. You're right. It's kind of a weird social psychology problem. Somebody do your thesis on that. Meanwhile, I want to cheer Sarah up by okay. sending her a holiday present. Really? Yeah, but you know what the problem is? I don't have time to go to the post office. Ugh, why would you have to go to the post office? No, you don't have to. Exactly. Oh, good. You don't want to deal with traffic. You don't want to deal do with that. parking. Ugh. You want to use our sponsor for today's show, Stamps.com, because it's packed at the mall, on the streets, and in the cars. Go to Stamps.com instead. Stamps.com, you can avoid all the hassle of going into the post office during the busy holiday season. Everything you do at the post office, you can do right from your desk, except maybe for avoiding people out in front of the building. But everything else you can do right from your desk. Buy and print official U.S. postage using your computer and printer. Print postage for any letter or package the instant you need it. Then the mailman picks it up because he's coming to your house anyway. It's easy and convenient. Just give it to her when she shows up. Here, thank you, Miss Postal Carrier. I use stamps.com. Because it makes it easy to send things back and forth when we do before you buy videos. Uh, you know, we've got these products. I don't want to lug them all around town. It's easy. I, I get a stamps.com. I print it up. I put it on the box. I hand it to the postal carrier. You should use it too. Right now, get this special offer when you use our promo code TNT. No risk trial. Plus a $110 bonus offer. Includes a digital scale so you can weigh your stuff. And up to $55 of free postage. Don't wait. Go to stamps.com before you do anything else. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in TNT. That's stamps.com. Enter TNT. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. What's on the calendar today, Sarah? Well, you know, the Google Doodle honors Grace Hopper, who would have been 97 years old today. If you're not familiar with her, early computer scientist. You can learn a lot more. Google.com. She discovered one of the first literal bugs. It was a moth. Great. True story. Hopper. Uh, Le Web Paris uh, starts tomorrow. You know, it's the first year in like five years that I haven't been there. Kind of feels weird. We'll get out of here. Usually in France right now. Should I go? Nah. Then eh. I'll send you a baguette. How's yeah, that? I don't know. It's uh, I'm sick of traveling. Uh, Le Web Paris starts tomorrow. It runs through Thursday the 12th. Um, everyone's going to have lots of baguettes. It's going to be a great time. Let's see if there's an email. Incoming message. Sure, it's a message from David. He says, as to iBeacon, Darren nailed the iBeacon in Lowe's and Home Depot as a great place for that. What about grocery stores? While I tend to go to the Publix near my home, but there are many other Publix grocery stores in my area I might stop at. Other places you would get really handy uh, would be at airports, cruise ships, Walmart, Target, Sam's, Costco, any large store. What about a university? So he's got lots of great ideas for where you could use iBeacon. Well, yeah, and the grocery store near my house just rearranged everything. It's taken me weeks to figure out where they put all the stuff. They, like, changed all the aisles. If I had iBeacon, it'd just be like, and it would, like, I use uh, Buy Me a Pie for my grocery list. If it could marry with those two, that's kind of brilliant, David. I like it. Buy Me a Pie also. Just literally, please, buy me a pie. Thank you, Sasha Segan, for joining us today. Always a pleasure. Uh, what are you working on over there at PCMag.com? You're always working on good stuff. Yeah, I mean, we're in the middle of the holiday shopping season here, which is uh, one of our biggest seasons because we're primarily a product review site. So it's uh, really about getting all the goods up there so people can decide what to buy for the holidays. Go to PCMag.com. We have reviews of practically everything. You can see what the good stuff is, what the bad stuff is, what to pick up, what not to pick up. And uh, then there will be uh, no remorse come New Year's. Check it out, PCMag.com. Yeah, I know this is this is crunch time for you guys over there. So uh, uh, thanks for thanks for taking the time to come on, man. I really appreciate it. Also, uh, some people in chat are um, correcting me that Grace Hopper wouldn't have been ninety-seven; she would have been one hundred and seven. So ah. even, even older and wiser. Very good. I will. Uh, I, I'm the one who put the ninety-seven in there, so don't blame Sarah. That's my mistake. Well, you know, blame both of us. Yeah, blame Grace Hopper for not being born when I wanted her to be. Come yeah, <laughs> she's. <laughs> hey, we're doing our open mic show. This is something we do every year where we bring some uh, members of the audience on uh, to talk about their technology stories uh, and, and their thoughts about the news of the year. If you would like to be one of them, send an email to tnt at twit.tv with the subject open mic. The deadline for submission is this Wednesday. So you got a couple days now. Uh, 
and uh, get your email in. Use the subject line open mic to TNT at twit.tv. You do need to be available Friday, December 13th at 2 p.m. Pacific for about an hour. That's when we're going to record the show and it'll go in our holiday week episodes that we put out. Uh, and apologies in advance. We've already got lots of people emailing us and we will only be able to pick two or three people to be on the show. Uh, so if we don't pick you, it's not personal. We just always have way too many good people to choose from. Uh, so we have to make a choice somehow. Anyway, get those in. TNT at twit.tv with the subject line open mic by Wednesday. Don't forget, you can have a voice in the stories we cover at our subreddit at technewstoday.reddit.com. You can email us. Our email address is tnt at twit.tv. And you can give us a call, leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. All that information and more is available at our website, twit.tv slash TNT. We'll be back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young as our guest. See you then. Bye.